Hey, welcome back in, everybody, to the Sports Fanatic News Sportscast. As we just gave you the NHL deadline wrap-up with some Stanley Cup contender projections of our top contenders, we're now going to get into some NBA basketball uh, action for you as May 16th is also, as of now, uh, the docket to end the season. Playoffs um, are starting to heat up, baby. Yep, as they're coming into the crunch run. And we also have a preview uh, this evening of who could be your Eastern Conference uh, Finals matchup of the Brooklyn Nets and Philadelphia 76ers in Philadelphia. Now, um, it is to note this won't be exactly the matchup of um, what we want to see in the postseason because James Harden's out with a hamstring. Uh, Kyrie Irving is taking some more personal leave. Um, So everybody is not going to be in. Oh, and I think LaMarcus Simmons is is out. LaMarcus Aldridge is a game-time decision with an illness. Um, okay. So there's not going to be as deep of a lineup, but these teams are also built, as we know, as, um, with the Nets and Sixers to with hand um, having guys out of the lineup. So even with guys out of the lineup, it will be interesting to see um, what they're able to do in this game um, and be able to get done. It does seem like for the Sixers, however – um, most guys are looking at this injury report here. Nobody's on it other than George Hill, who's still out with his thumb that they acquired um, today. So it seems like they will have their lineup go. But it's still going to be a game that's still interesting and fun to watch because you still got KD going up against Joe Embiid in this game, which even though you don't have the other two in, that in itself is still interesting basketball to watch. You got a former Sixer and Shaman as a good shooter and Joe Harris, the Sixers sometime. Um the one way you can still sometimes um beat them is by getting up enough threes and then cashing them in um when you're really consistent on your threes. So it'll be interesting to see how they're able to man those guys. And you still got Blake Griffin who ever since going to the Nets uh seems to be um, his old, not not his old athletic self, but less of a shell of his old athletic self, and um, starting to come out of his bubble a bit and seem to be spewing some confidence. So, uh, they're seven and three in their last ten. If I'm not mistaken, the Sixers are one less than that. Yeah, they're six and four in their last ten. Um, so both of these teams are looking pretty solid. I think this will be a good game. It's just I wouldn't necessarily rank it as a preview to the Eastern Conference Finals, just because you don't have everybody in. But it's still a good game just to see um, where everyone's at and even with guys out, where yeah. the Nets – it's really a better game to see for Nets fans with people out. How close do they get to the Sixers or do they even beat the Sixers with people out? Because then that would show you that they're definitely most likely the favorites um, for going into the postseason right. because they beat them with people out. This game is kind of the game to, I think, show odds makers who do we like to clarify for them. Nessus, not not if it's the Sixers, but if it's the Nets that Nets. they're the favorite. Yeah, because if the Nets win this game shorthanded, they're going to go. Well, the Sixers had everybody in. The Nets had two of their main guys out in Harden and Kyrie, and also Aldridge, and they still beat them. So we have to favor them now if this right. becomes. A series where for the Sixers, if they win, I don't think it'll change much because they say they beat them, they took advantage, they did what they were supposed to do and had to do. Right. But I think this is definitely a game that could change uh, most people's views of just how good the Nets are. Well, uh, Durant is scheduled to play. Exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah, for this game, and uh, the Sixers are four and one on the series so far this year. Okay. Yeah. So. I mean, and and it's not like they were Although close most games. Of these games were prior to yeah half of these people coming into the oh yeah um team with Brooklyn. So there's I mean, also the last that. time the last time they played was February twentieth. Okay, yeah. so it's been a while, and you know, it's a little bit's changed. But the fact that they were four and one, and the fact that these games, some of them weren't even close, like one hundred and twenty four to one hundred and eight. 112 yeah. to 104, you know. Now, the one game that, that that the Nets did win, it was the Nets 122 and the Sixers 109. Okay. You know what I mean? So I, I do agree with what you're saying. This is going to definitely um, 
let people know what's going to be going on with the Nets, but without their two big stars, Irving or uh, Kyrie and and Harding out, even though Durant's going to play, Sixers are not all the way there either. So it's not the full full matchup. And I think even when it is going to be a full full matchup, it ends, it's the Sixers are pretty much all the way there. Unless okay, if, unless if one of our two stars decides to rest this game, then the Sixers. Okay, yeah, because I wasn't sure if Simmons was going to play or not. But either way. I still think that the Sixers are going to be able to take care of business. And even if this does become a series, which it probably won't, right? Because one does not play two in in the seedings, right? It could become a series in the finals if you get the one and the two to the Eastern. If if both of them. Only in the finals. Okay, so they do the same thing. Finals, I think. Right. Okay, so they do the same thing in basketball that they do where the top seed plays the lowest seed. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure it could become a series in the Eastern. If I'm not, I feel like that's the, just what I've heard while watching. It would be a longer road for for uh, Brooklyn to try to get back to that than it would be, you know what I mean? Um, that's if the if yeah if the standings actually shake out how they are right now. But these teams are pretty much that's the other thing. These teams are even right now too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These teams are going to shake out really where they're going, um, for the rest of the season, but. It's also, I think both of them at this point are trying to make sure they primarily they keep their guys healthy, stay above the box, obviously, but keep their guys healthy and um, make sure nobody gets injured going in the playoff run while balanced and still trying to win these last handful of regular season games. I think that's the primary thing for both of those teams. Okay, so they're only looking at, um, so they're not playing, they're playing what, 81 games or? No, they're playing less in the, uh, NBA this season. I can't remember what the exact number became, but it wasn't it wasn't the normal because eighty one would basically be they might as well have just played eighty two if they played. That's uh, what I mean. So it, it's it's definitely um a little bit less than I don't remember the exact um Okay, because I'm looking at it right now and so seventy two. They played ten less games. Okay, so seventy two. So okay, 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 okay. So the Sixers have a couple of games left. Yeah, yeah, but all teams don't have because you're going to May 16th. The NBA also isn't as running gun as hot, like isn't as condensed as we've seen the hockey schedule. They're not playing games like every other night. Five or... or seven nights you don't see as much in basketball. Okay. Here. So I think – um they're they're doing a pretty good job um for sure because they're going all over and somehow it's uh similar to baseball it's not um affecting them um as much so maybe the bubble maybe the bubble thing doesn't work out as well as all of us first thought <laughs> in effect, right so they, so effect the Sixers have itself. effectively sixteen games left yeah yeah pretty much yeah that that yeah that would be right math wise okay yeah. okay so. So that's about where they're at. Okay, sixteen games left, so they're tied with Brooklyn. Milwaukee's three and a half back. The Hawks are seven and a half, and Celtics are eight and a half, and Miami nine. Mm-hmm. How many? Of the, how many of the remaining games do the Sixers need to win in order to a stay above the Nets and or b stay above the Bucks? I think staying above the Bucks is obviously easier because you already have a three and a half. Um, lead. Right. So as long as you don't go on like a four game losing streak, uh, you should okay. be able to stay ahead the box. Okay. As as, like even if you play 500, which you don't want to do, but if you play 500 basketball around at the season, you would stay ahead the box because it, it you you're three and go eight, eight and eight down the stretch. stretch. Yeah. Okay. But I don't see them doing that anyway. So I think um, both of these teams will be fine staying above the box. I think it's just going to be a battle at the end of who gets first, who gets second. Yeah. But when it comes to that, um, I think either of these teams that they end up playing Charlotte and or the Knicks should be able to beat either of those teams, no matter if you're in first or second or if you end up playing the Pacers or Bulls since they're doing that compete thing uh, with the seven through ten teams. You should be able to beat those teams also. So I feel like no matter if you're first or second, that shouldn't screw you really. You just want to stay in first or second. You yeah. don't want to move down. Yeah, that's, yeah that's, obviously, that's, no. That, that's, all, that's all it is. But I think both of those teams are clearly the favorites of the West. And then Milwaukee's like, these teams are here. Milwaukee's like here. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So I think that that's just the way it is. I don't think Atlanta is a team that's ready to make a deep run. They're the team in fourth. They're still a year away from having the bigger effect of making those deeper runs with the team they have. But it is hats off for them for bringing in Bogdanovich, excuse me, and having him fit in, having Kevin Herter, bringing in Lou Williams, showing your fan base that you definitely want to show that we're here now and we're here to stay rather than just we're here for the future. I mean, Boston over the last couple of years have perennially been in the playoffs. No, I was talking about the Hawks. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, Atlanta's a team that I that uh well Boston I don't think is going to compete in the in terms of going anywhere in the postseason. Yeah, no. Yeah, they're 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 just they're, they're a team that I think is more accredited to how good Brad Stevens knows how to coach a team this yeah. season than it is them having the most perennial talent on their right. Uh, but team. Atlanta, not so much though. You know what I mean? Yeah, Atlanta's a team that's still really young. That's why I think bringing in Lou will help. You brought in Bogdanovich. You have Young. You have Collins, still really young. You brought in Capella. Cam Reddish is really young. Uh, so is obviously Hunter Herder. I think they're just a year or two away from being that team that's going to make that deep playoff run. They're the team that now impresses you when you go, oh, look at those Atlanta Hawks. And then in a year or two, you're going to start talking <laughs> yeah, look about at those them. Atlanta Hawks now. Boy, they're, they're playing a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> but when it comes to fresh teams, because I think in the East we have clear cut two favorites most people yeah. see when it comes to your championship are the Sixers and Nets. In the West, that is not the case whatsoever. Um, because you have now, let's be honest, the 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 Lakers have always seemed like a team that are let's get to the playoffs and then we're gonna just go absolutely ballistic and look like the Lakers again. Um, so if Anthony Davis comes back in, LeBron comes back in, um, and everything starts moving fine and dandy and everybody's uh, all happy in L.A., uh, then, yeah, you, you would still obviously um, have a chance there with the Lakers if those guys come back at the right time. And the key pivotal point is Anthony Davis has to be at least, I would say, 80%. At uh, least. So he still enough. hasn't come back yet? No, either has LeBron. <laughs> So okay. that's that's why the Lakers have um, uh, seven fall, games back, fall, yeah, falling off a little bit, which is why I don't think it's necessarily um, a good judgment of really where their team's at because they're missing the two biggest guys on their team. That their team is the most built around, almost like Drysaddle McDavid run through these two dudes. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah and, and when so, they're not there, uh, and they're not there, so yeah, that's not going to help you right now. <laughs> Um, the team that emerged the most, the Suns are a great team this year to watch and everything. They're nine and one in their last 10. The only thing that uh, I don't want to say they're a stone cold championship contender yet is because other than they brought in Chris Paul, that's why I throw them in the 60, 40, 60 for being a contender, 40 for knockout. Oh, yeah. You added Paul, which is the great veteran to hone in your youngsters, but minus Chris Paul, they're a very young yeah. developing uh, similar to the Hawks, just way just ahead of the Hawks because they have that veteran playmaker and Paul that they brought in. Um, right. They have, But they have Booker. They have Mikel Bridges, who's really young. Uh, they brought in Sorek, who's a good bench player. DeAndre Aiden's young. So I'm going 60, 40, 60 percent they can uh, contend for if 40 they can. And that also is going to heavily depend on what the heck is going on with the Lakers' health. Um and also, if the Clippers decide, uh, see, I was just going to ask you to, about the Clippers. To, what what's to be more like the Clippers in the postseason? End of late, they're on a six game winning streak. Now they went eight and two. They're starting to come back in the standings. Yep. If they can do it, Rondo, you get for the playoffs. That's the reason at this point of his career, you have Rondo on your team so he can just facilitate and step up his game in the playoffs. So that made good sense to me. Leonard's been out a bit. Sabak has been out a bit. So that's affected them. Again, it's health. If all if if, if those guys are completely healthy, especially Kawhi Leonard, <laughs> yeah, um, then uh, there'll be a team that I think is more. 70 30 to compete for the finals they they would have a 70 percent chance of competing for it and a 30 percent chance of not doing as much okay. where i still think if the lakers are healthy they're right around the clippers with the percentile it's just i would put them more at the 65 percent now just because i have so many questions of i feel like anthony davis won't even be 80 like i feel like when he comes back yeah of how he yeah. came back and was such hobbly that you would almost want to be like how 
Kellerman was, who I don't normally always agree with, and just say, don't freaking play. Yeah. Like, like be the guy to go on TV and say, no, don't be stupid. Don't go on the court. I don't care if you want to win the finals. You're good to get injured. And then that turned that turned out to be one of the things that Max Kellerman was most right about in his entire life. Kevin Durant getting injured in the postseason. So. One, one thing. One. <laughs> so, I mean, Kellerman right about one thing. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, that's, that's just the way it is. I think you have to be smart here. Yeah. Um. I don't want to see the Lakers uh, bring back Anthony Davis if he's not fully ready. That's why I put them as 65. Um, I st- I would say now, just because of the experience you have Leonard who won, my favorite at the 70-30 would probably be the Clippers for the West just because of experience. But then my next team, just because of how good they're performing and kind of have um, another guy that's a really good playmaker that um, – it might be a much giving him this praise, but some people, but I've heard it on NBA TV from some like Grand Hill and others. Um, Michael Conley kind of reminds you of a mini CP3 as a veteran that can facilitate and play make for you for the Utah Jazz out there. And um, he's really helped them settle down their young team and really hone in their young team with a Bogdan Bogdanovich. Um, you have Donovan Mitchell, who's obviously one of the best ballers in the league that averages 26.5. Um, so he's a very good player, obviously. They have good depth players in Royce O'Neal, great defender. Ilya Silver can play off the bench. Favors is a very good guy for the room that can still do some stuff for you. And then Rudy Gobert is one of the best double-double defending centers in the league. So, um, and rebounding, obviously, averages a double-double. So I think the Jazz would honestly be my second team right now just because of circumstance. Obviously, coming into the season, I did not expect myself to say that I think two of the top teams that are contenders in the West are the Jazz and Sun. Uh, yeah, but, you right. know, here we are. Um where and both well, you know. <laughs> have to give them credit is because they defined a point guard that was a veteran and went, this guy is going to help our group in a leadership capacity and an on-the-court playmate through the youngsters capacity. And that's what both Mike Conley and Chris Paul have done for their respective teams to get them to where they're at right now and actually put them in the top of the – Oh, exactly. Yeah, them in the you top two. So if I had to rank order there, I would go Clippers first just because of experience. You have Kawhi on your team. You won with the – um I'm going to say the Pelicans. You won with the Raptors. <laughs> uh, and the Pelicans haven't won anything in years. Their fans would be elated if they won with it. Yeah, with right. Them. I was going to say, um, yeah. And then I would put the – jazz second right now just because you do have like rudy gobert's been in the league for a good bit and mitchell's one of those players even as a young player almost reminds you of a guy that's been in the league for like 10 years already just from how confident and and he's young yeah yeah he's young well um getting his stuff done similar to tatum who is a big uh success story in boston even in a year they're not doing as good as i think their fans overall hoped but um I would go with that. I would go Clippers, Jazz. This one depends on health. If they're actually, if Davis is at eighty percent, the Lakers are third because of um, just you have the LeBron Davis effect. If not, I would actually probably put the Suns third and then put the Lakers okay. um, fourth at that point. Okay, um, they might even be a little bit more iffy, uh, kind of right there with Denver if Anthony Davis ain't playing right. or. Is out, so I would say the West is a little bit more of a crapshoot right now of a bunch of teams that uh, we're going to have to really watch in these final uh, weeks of the season, final yep. month of the season, since it is the 14th and the season is supposed to end on the 16th, so month and two yep. days, um, and what they're able to um, do here, because uh, I think that's how, as we do our show coming into the stretch run, I yeah. would rank it as time goes on if the. Yeah. Jazz and Suns stay hot, and then say AD and LeBron come back for cups of coffee. If AD clearly does not look by the end of the season healthy, then I'm going to uh, obviously have to change that. Opinions. <laughs> um, if he does, yeah. then I might put the Lakers higher. So right now they're only taking the top six, right? No, they're doing. You get in automatically. Is that then seven through ten as play-ins to see who gets the last spots that's how they're doing it this year so that's why when i explained the sixers and nets i said i think either team should be able to beat either charlotte the knicks the pacers or the bulls yeah yeah okay so 
So how does this whole thing work now? So at the end of the That's year, more of a question. stay tuned for that for Sunday's show. Andrew can explain that better than me. I'm not as in depth with. Uh, okay, because uh, doesn't make awful. sense. But all right, uh, it's well. something and see who gets in from the seven through ten to be the playoff team. But I don't know why they decided to do that. I think it was just for extra pizzazz this year. But because um, they're only and, playing, because they're only playing it, seventy games. It, it, 10 games makes a difference if you're like basically if it ends like it is now the bulls not as much 14 and a half to nine and a half but 11 and a half games to nine and a half games playing a couple games to try to play and would make a difference then so i think it is probably for that reason uh you're probably right on that but if you didn't have um anything else to go to uh for the nba no, no man. i think uh, I think we wrapped that up pretty good for your yep. basketball. And you think are your top contenders there. I hope everyone enjoyed that. And I also have to remember to say this in the video more. If you enjoy what we're doing, please uh, like, comment, and subscribe to Steel's channel, Steel Flyers, and also the Sports Fanatic news page, my channel. We're trying to get to um, 140 as soon as we can. I think it's at 128 now. I got a yep. subscriber yesterday. So we're going up a little bit, and uh, we really appreciate your support, but now we're get into once my computer enjoys loading, um, NFL mock drafts and um, who we think um could go to our teams. I do not want a seventh round mock draft. Give me an actual mock draft. I, I have to say this: I've I've been a little bit kind of a wait and see what's going to happen here with with the uh, with the NFL. Um, the the league uh, year started, and there was a lot, and there was some free agency moves took place, sure. and some and some different faces in, in some new places. Uh, you know what I mean? And so, uh, this draft I think is going to be rather interesting uh, because you got uh, a lot of teams right now seem to be jockeying for those top three, those top three or four picks right now. You know what I mean? And so. <clears throat> I don't know, man. I'm, I've been looking at some of these mock drafts, and I just, gosh. Well, I think the first is obvious. Um, yeah, I, I feel think like, that's yeah. The first is going to be Trevor to Jacksonville. I yeah, think. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, even even though they they are probably will, uh, I have a feeling that Jacksonville is probably gonna is probably gonna um, deal Gardner Minshew. Um, yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, yeah so. So that they'll be able to bring this this quarterback in here, uh, Trevor Lawrence. Um, so they also made some moves in the offseason to bring some some folks in there to Jacksonville as well to help out too. But yeah, that 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 I think is a foregone conclusion. Trevor Lawrence, uh, quarterback to the uh, <laughs> Jacksonville Jaguars, but San Francisco moved up. The Jets moved around. The uh, Patriots moved around. The Bengals moved around to get to some of these. The Miami moved around. You know, they made some trades so they could get higher in the draft. Yeah, yeah, and I think uh, the, a lot of them. Some of those teams are for um, different reasons. It does seem like when you look at a lot of mocks, um, your top three might be quarterbacks where I think the Jets are also, it seems like they're heavily leaning towards Zach Wilson, especially after the Darnold trade. So I feel like yeah. um, Zach Wilson is um, most likely going to go to the Jets, which is the guy that most people, other than Trevor Lawrence, because he's basically the Mahomes guy in the draft. That's the unicorn. Um, but other than him, um, you have Wilson would probably be the arm talent uh, yeah. Guy. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So um, there are some reported off the field and injury issues with him, but I feel like that's more in the realm of like just settle him down mature wise, like the Browns did with Baker rather than it is like Ryan Leaf or anything. Like, I don't think he's anywhere near that. I think it's more yeah. he just needs to be the dude that comes in after a year or two, like we saw with Mayfield and, um, Cleveland. Cleveland this yeah. year he actually matured and when he would lose would blame himself and not other people which is um let's hope let's, what let's I think hope. um you see for I, Wilson just seems like he's a very good quarterback I don't think I have to worry about that too much to be but 
Um, I, I think uh, that's the guy that might be able to fix it for the Jets just because uh, he's also a guy that seems to get rid of the ball, at least from watching him a little bit at a BYU highlights. Yeah. Highlights. Um, fairly quick when the rush is coming, which is obviously something the Jets obviously need to have on their team uh, because their offensive line usually sucks. So, well, okay, see, uh, now that's going to be the thing. <laughs> that's going to be the thing with the Jets. Okay, here's – and this is – this goes all straight back to this not being the guy that the current regime picked. And that's the only reason why Sam Donald's going away because if you look at – if you look at the the ratings, you look at the size, you look at the same kind of quarterback that Zach Wilson is, that's kind of the same kind of guy that Sam Darnold is. 6'2", 214 pounds. Sam Darnold's a little taller, right, and I think has a little bit more of a, a, of, a of an arm, I think, than, than Wilson does. You know what I'm saying? But it, it's one of those things. You know, you know what I mean? It's like you didn't get to pick the quarterback, so you don't like him, so you're going to pick your guy. So you trade away Sam Darnold so you can get your guy. And that's all I think is going on here with the Jets, quite frankly. You know what I mean? I, I Honestly, I think Sam Darnold is a good quarterback. No, I think he is, too. I think it's just at this point it's best for him to go somewhere else and it's best for the Jets to go somewhere else just because you kind of put him in that exactly. bad spot at this point. Um, I mean, the I kid do. was running for his life. I mean, you know... That, they they had no offensive line there for him. They had no run game. They had nobody to throw the ball to. They're they're kind of doing the same thing here with Zach Wilson. Now they did kind of go out and get some some stuff in the free agency market, but for the most part, you know, they better draft well. <laughs> yeah, you would hope they're yeah, they, they need to um obviously a drip. They have Keenan Cole. Uh they have Cole, the guy that if he can stay healthy, he's pretty good. Um from um, the Jaguars now on the Jets, and then Crowder, who's obviously good if he can stay healthy. But beyond, uh, and if Denzel Mims develops, I guess. But beyond them, they don't have um, the most um, consistent guys you look to to say, oh, yeah, they're going to consistently uh, right. throw it to those guys. Um, but I do think, yeah, it makes sense. That makes sense to me. They're a team. They wanted to get their own cat in the – um, house rather than having somebody else's and Darnold's going to go on to a team that it seems like he'll probably have better success with um, in uh, the Carolina Panthers and be able to kind of um, get, I, or not I like Cam that move or, I really was, was, was it Carolina or Sam Darnold now you're going to make me have to look it up now I, I thought it was to Carolina I thought it was too. They just didn't change the roster sheet. I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 All right. We were right. We were right. We just yeah. had to double check. I'm glad we do that though. I'm glad what? we double check to make sure yeah. so that we get the correct and truthful information out there. I really like that move with with going to Carolina because I think that gives Carolina a really decent quarterback now to go along with McCaffrey and, and to get that team where they need to go. Okay. Uh, I, I just like that move. I really like that move. I don't think that Teddy Bridgewater is the guy or was the guy there in Carolina anyway. You know what I mean? So uh, I, I, I like Sam Donald there in, in Carolina. I think that's going to be a good move for them at least, you know what I mean? So um, there's a lot of other things too here with, the, the next cat on the list, which is going to be Mac Jones. He's the other quarterback that is on the list, and he's uh, from well, Alabama. Maybe. I would think Justin Fields will get picked before Mac. You think? Yeah, because in most mocks, Justin Fields projected to either the 49ers or the, well, if the Falcons want to move on from Matt Ryan. That's the bigger question there. Right, um, and, and or, or Denver maybe. Yeah, or Denver. If he goes to Denver, if he drops to Denver, they'll probably um, snag him. But I, I feel like Fields will go before Jones, and then Jones will go after. In this mock, they don't have Jones going. They actually have Lance going to Denver, so they have him going before. Well, either way you slice it, I think San Francisco is going to be in the market for a quarterback, and Denver is definitely in the market for a quarterback. Okay. 
So no matter how you slice it, either one of those two teams is either going to get Mac Jones and or Justin Fields, right? Yeah, this one actually has Jones going or Trey Lance because Trey Lance is another quarterback that a lot of people like from North Dakota for the bigger upside. Where Mac Jones is more, you just know what he is. He probably like his upside's probably kind of where it's at. <laughs> Because yeah. he's more of a pocket passer and just a right. game manager. Right, right, so right. So you kind of know what you're getting from the forefront where usually those guys drop. And then the guys that you like for their potential future talent, like the Lances of the world, usually are the guys that go. See, but, now, the, the mock draft that I'm looking at, right, has quarterbacks going in the first four, right? So they got Jacksonville taking Lawrence. They got the Jets taking Wilson, the 49ers taking Jones, and they got the New England taking uh, Trey Lance. So they got New England trading all the way up to there. Yeah. So, so they get one of those mock drafts that they write and throw in a bunch of trades. and Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is a, a trade from the Falcons. Okay. So, yeah, because so, the Falcons would have fourth, which fourth. is where a lot of people have them picking Kyle Pitts because um, he's the receiver, right. tight end guy that can easily play receiver or tight end just because right. he's too fast. Uh, he's so fast of a tight end. Um, so that's who they have him going. Yeah, I mean, that, that could happen. I think it's kind of odd. I never really loved the – unless if you maybe do a couple, but when people write the whole mock drafts with a crap ton of trades, I never really like that because I think it's just – Yeah, more, it makes like, it really they, hard. Uh, I think it's just more you trying to get clickbait at that point. Um, <laughs> where – because a lot of that – like that, there's never that many – Trades is usually a couple, but some people put it in with like there's four different trades in the first round. And you'd be like, yeah, that's probably not going to happen. But yeah, um, I do think in this mock draft, who they have Cincinnati going with, they do need to go with one of the linemen. And obviously, at their pick, getting Penny Sewell would make sense. Uh, being uh, you want to protect Joe Burrow uh, at all costs, um, coming back off his injury too. So I think uh, getting someone like him would be the right pick. Uh, if they keep that pick there for Cincinnati. Right. You know, the other team, too, uh, that I think is going to potentially make uh, some maybe some moves. I mean, I think New England could make some moves. You know what I mean? You you might maybe. see the New England might also think Mac Jones falls to them, <laughs> depending how much they think he fought. Because in this mock, well, they're picking going. 15th right now. Yeah, Because in this mock, he's not going before. um them like they could pick him in this mock where they're at. Yeah. They just decided to pick Zaven Collins, uh, the DN from Tulsa. Uh, okay. So, okay. Uh, that that's how this mock where this mock has him going because I'm scrolling down. It has him going somewhere between seventeen to thirty two. Yeah. Okay. Man. So now we talked about a bunch of the other teams here that we feel potentially could have some other things going on here so let's, let's has, i wanted to focus in on the eagles um Chicago, the eagles Chicago yeah town is getting mac jones at 20 according to uh this this that one because uh, they have dalton and they have Foles. so um the thing starts with the bears can't be serious with having andy dalton as their starting quarterback in 2021 <laughs> uh, but uh, Jones is somebody that <laughs> that, um, that could come in to keep for that job. Uh, both Nick Foles right. and um, and uh, Andy Dalton out there. So it seems like that would be something that could make sense for the Bears to go yeah. with him if he falls with them. It also makes sense for New England to pick him if uh, he goes if he's still there at fifteen too. So I wouldn't be surprised if they pick him at fifteen. Right. So now your Eagles, right? You guys made some trades and moved up in the draft, right? That that whole uh, trade thing around there with Miami well, got you. We ended up moving back in the draft, actually. Cause or Matt moving up. back. Okay, I'm sorry. So you're you're at 12th now, all right? You you got rid of uh, Carson Wentz. You brought in Flacco. You're going with Jalen Hurts, right? You you lost uh, some Jeez. receivers. Yeah. You lost some receivers in Aguilar and uh, and Jackson, right? Who are you guys picking, man? 
Uh, most mocks, it drops. It kind of depends where the receivers go because some people, when you listen to them, think Jalen Waddles the higher pop guy because he, you haven't seen everything from him yet. Where a lot of people think Devonte yeah. is going to be very good in the NFL, but he's he's going to he's where he's at. He's going to come and be very good and probably stay there. Where a lot of people think Waddle's a guy that'll come in, be pretty good, and then just keep getting better, but then potentially become like Julio, I think. Mm-hmm. So that it, it, I think it'll depend what guy falls. I'm perfectly fine with if either of those two fall to the Eagles, um, taking one of Devontae Smith, um, or or if Jamar, if somehow Jamar Chase doesn't go top ten and then fall. Uh, yeah. Obviously, that would work, but I just don't see that being as much of a because he's the guy that a lot of people went. That's Julio. That could be Julio Jones part two. So I don't see him falling. Um, but if someone of Smith or Waddle fall, Waddle's the guy that a lot of more people have projected is falling. But either of those two are people I would go with because you need wide receivers to bring in uh, for Jalen Hurts. Um, and Hurts is also a huge fan of um, Waddle. Um, who he thinks will have the best uh, career in the 2021 um, NFL draft. Hertz actually answered that was uh, Jalen Waddle. So right. if he's there and the Eagles don't pick him, then they're stupid. So let's just let, let, let's <laughs> let's just let's just get that out in the open um, uh, before, before we start. Um, just yeah. because he's already the quarterback's already a big fan of him. He has chemistry before he walks into the building. You're literally stupid if you don't pick somebody that is yeah. already uh, instant chemistry. If he's not there, then there's a couple people. The O tackle, I don't know a lot of them, but I've read about him in some mock uh, that's projected for the Chargers, the USC guy, Vera Tucker. Um, it seems like um, they said he played really well at left tackle for the Trojans, and the Eagles obviously with Peters aging, not having guys step up. Um, at the left tackle position since he's aged, that might be a pretty good asset to bring on. It's just I don't know as much about him personally. I just know from reading stuff. But if he's as good as these people say and he decided to decide to opt back in and that really benefited him opting back into USC for this final year and really showing up and showing out, he seems to have the right mindset and uh, the right uh goods for what the Eagles could need if there isn't the receiver they want there anymore. Or maybe that guy from V Tech, um Christian Dar- Darisol. Yeah, Darisol um is also a guy six five, um, three hundred and fourteen pounds. Yeah, I wouldn't mind having him. He's a guy you could get, <laughs> could get as well. So there's a couple linemen I would think would probably be the next guys just because I think your cornerbacks at that point, unless if you're picking Caleb Farley at twelve, are probably not going to be there anymore looking at a couple of the mocks that I pulled up while we were here. So going off of that, I would say if Waddle or Smith still there or Vera Tucker or Darisol. And then, um, I mean, Caleb Fairley is a guy that's interesting because he opted out of the 2021 season. He probably would be higher if he didn't. Um, he just has some injury concerns, which is more yeah. why I want the Eagles. The Eagles haven't hit very good in the past when it came to people having some injury concerns coming out of the draft. So I'd rather just go with the guys I said because of that. I yeah. think his skill set's fine. I just, I just, when I see guys that have injury history with the Eagles, they haven't had good luck in the past. I'm with you. Uh, I like all the, I like all the selections that you have there for the Eagles. I think that gives them a, a pretty good balance as far as. Uh, some guys that they can select and some needs that they're definitely going to have, you know what I mean, for this year. Um, the Eagles are we're, we're definitely on the outside looking in uh, this past season and any help that they can get for Jalen Hurts, whether it be protection or whether it be somebody for him to throw the ball to would be great. And any size uh, that, that Philadelphia could get on the defensive side of the ball, uh, especially on their line and then especially uh, with their uh, covers, um, I think that would be um, also very helpful for Philadelphia as well, yeah. too. Well, they made a smart pickup of bringing in the kid from, uh, well, not a kid, but the guy from uh, Minnesota and Eric Wilson. Uh, yeah, 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 really yeah. Um, we had mm-hmm. a guy come in in Singleton who was one of the lone bright spots, emerges a good linebacker all of a sudden for the Eagles last year, and now you have Wilson coming in so you can have a couple guys there. 
Exactly. Um, obviously, <laughs> another interesting name would be if Parsons somehow falls to the Eagles with the Eagles debate. See three. now, now hold hold your hold your roll there, Mister. Hold your roll there, Mister. Now you're, you're you're starting to you're starting to pull too many names out of here away from some of the. I, I, that's who I was going to talk about for the Steelers, because I think he could potentially fall to the Steelers, and that would be a really good pick. He also opted out of the season this past year for Penn mm-hmm. State. Yeah, okay. which is what has him a little bit lower. Yeah, right. Same so with I, right, yeah. Um, I, I, I like Fairly or Farley as well too. Caleb Farley. I thought he he would be a good cornerback. I think he'd be a good pickup for for the Steelers. This, what this actually has you picking a corner. I don't know if you know. I don't know much about this guy. Aaron Robinson from UCF is a big corner, six one one ninety three, who tackles well. It says they could target the best secondary player available with this pick is what uh, Walter uh, football thinks would be the case. Yeah. I, I would not have a problem with that, but that's, but, and that's kind of where I put like uh, 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 Parsons in there. Cause I think he would be a really good fit in Pittsburgh. Okay. And he also, I feel like you might have to trade up a bit for him though. Most mocks I've saw had him in the teens, but yeah, if you, if you could get him yeah. there, that would be great. But uh, I guess, but especially could, the reason I with losing... that up is my follow-up question is, would you trade up for him? Yeah, I would probably trade up for him. Uh, I would trade up for somebody like that, especially after losing Bud Dupree. Now, we we do have Alex Highsmith. We drafted him last year, and then we also got Bush coming back, okay? Uh, and we did re-sign Splain, okay? And, and we also have a couple of depth guys there as well with Will, Williamson. Um, and then we also have um, TJ, okay? But as, you, as we saw last year, our top three linebackers went down and we were pretty much scurrying around. You know what I mean? And Pittsburgh historically is known for drafting linebackers because they just, they play on special teams. They, you know what I mean? And and we can convert. A lot of times we'll take a, a linebacker and convert them to a D end. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or, or the other way around, we'll take a D end and convert him to a linebacker. You know what I mean? Pittsburgh needs offensive linemen. OK, with with Marquise Pouncey retiring and potentially Villanueva not being re-signed. OK, they, they did get Finney uh, re-signed uh, uh, back on the team. But uh, we need to draft a young offensive lineman because I think the Castro is probably not going to get re-signed as well. You know what I mean? So uh, we're going to need some offensive linemen. I like this Rashawn Slater from Northwestern. Um, I don't know if he's going to fall to us, uh, but I, I would take that all day. I, that, that Christian Darasol, I wouldn't mind having him either. It's really cool. big dude, 6'5", 314 pounds, um, second overall in his rank on that, on that position. I wouldn't mind having him either. Um, as far as some of the other guys that we talked about as well, we could go for a running back. Pittsburgh might be the first team to take a running back off the board this year. But I've been seeing that guy, uh, Najee, I think his name is. Um, and I, I think he's either from Alabama or USC or somewhere. I can't remember what his, uh, where he's from, but the, the, they've been kind of looking at him for that. You know what I mean? So Pittsburgh has a lot of needs and new offensive coordinator now, new quarterbacks coach, new defensive backs coach. Okay. So there's some new coaching going on in there. And then we lost a lot of our back end. We lost Hilton. We lost Nelson. OK, so we also need a cornerback or a safety or somebody back there to help out Edmonds. You know what I mean? So, well, this it, uh, this uh, interestingly, the speaking of trades, the CBS one as uh, the Packers giving you their first rounder at 29, a third at 92 for number 24 and a fourth rounder at 140. So they could get Greg Newsom, the second who's the D back. And then, yeah. With your pick, you would get Alex Leatherwood, who's the offensive lineman from Alabama, Which who's ranked would... seventh as an offensive lineman, according to this, yep, uh, 37th nice overall. Um, we could name any other need for Pittsburgh in his draft. Leatherwood can play guard or tackle, but has the physical tools to settle in a tackle over the long haul if that is what is needed. Exactly. And he has that big body. He's six six. You know what I mean? 312 pounds. He's got that big body. Plus, he played for Alabama. 
I'll take any Al- yeah. Alabama lineman all day. I wonder day. if you would have interest with this one guy, because this one guy's ranked the first edge rusher, uh, and he went to state, uh, Jason Owa, Owa um, who had um, last any season. Any Penn uh, State boy, bring him. Bring him. Well, it, 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 last season he didn't have the sacks, but they said it's hard to turn him away because it was remarkable, a pro day, and just the skill he has and athletic um, ability. He's also um, really good at run stopping. He's also really good at eating up double teams, okay, because that's what he basically did at Penn State. You know what yeah, I'm saying? He's very big for an edge rusher. So you talked about converting former edge rushers to play some of your linebacker position. He seems like the athletic guy that would fit into that Steelers – Mice. Exactly. That you know who a- you know who else I would really like to see the Steelers look at to is another Penn State guy. Is that um, Fairmuth, the tight end? Oh yeah. He, the, um, he he's he's like the he's second. like the yeah he he's like Gronkowski. He's that same size, that same build. He he's got that same kind of lumbering when he runs down the field. Like he's not the fastest guy, you know what I mean? But he'll no, run no, you over. Like- yeah, that's why Kyle Pitts is the first. Player. Yeah, <laughs> this lightning, big can catch anything, and he pretty much is Calvin Johnson at tight end. Yeah, yeah, college. pretty as a tight end. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know what I mean. So either one of those, I would love to see either one of those players land at Pittsburgh. I, I'm here's what I'm so tired of. Always, what teams do is they take the quote unquote best athlete available. Well. In all the years that I've been watching football and in all the years that we've been... Najee Harris is who you were thinking of, by the way. Najee Harris, that's it. Um, uh, all that's the years... That's actually have you getting uh, in this mock draft with us. Yeah, I, I don't think so. I, I we, we picked a, a running back last year, and even though James Conner signed with Arizona earlier this week, I think I think our running back room is just fine. Okay? I, I, I would much rather spend draft picks on other positions of need instead of the... Best athlete available. No, the best athlete available might not be somebody that's going to fit on our team. I I want the best athlete available for the position of need. Yeah, yeah, I think that is weird how teams tend to do that. Um, it's with all sports. It's not just with football. I don't it's get not it. Not just with football, but uh, it, I think uh, you should just get what you need more. I mean, that's nipped uh, for baseball. The Phillies in the butt trying to get a bunch of infielders <laughs> to convert to outfielders, and then uh, it, it doesn't work. Do you know? Show. Yeah, it doesn't uh, work. <laughs> I would say. Well, you guys have who'd you draft last year as a running back? McFarland. Oh, okay, because, yeah, I was looking on here. Okay, Anthony McFarland, okay. Yeah, yeah. Because I was looking on here. Out of Maryland? I'm solicited. Yeah, Yeah. and then we have Samuels and, um, oh, gosh, there's another guy, too, and I can't think of it. Yeah, Benny Snell Jr. Snell. Yep. Galen Belange. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, because we picked one up. That was Belange, I guess? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And then and then Pittsburgh also got that uh what what was his name? Dwayne Haskins from Washington. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, he Haskins, he was and they have Rudolph still, yeah. Right, and Rudolph and then Ben. Right. And then we re signed Juju for one year. So we got Juju, Claypool, Deontay, uh, Deontay and and um and uh Washington. uh Washington. J Wash, right? So Good receiving core, and then we got uh, two. Uh, now, Vance McDonald just retired um, just this past season, um, so we got Eric Ebron. We need a tight end. Yeah, less if now sometimes tight ends or those positions the random dude steps up that you don't expect before the well <laughs> just from playing. For the last fantasy. two years, yeah. Pittsburgh has had tackle eligible, right? And Zach Banner has been that player for us for the last two years, except he got hurt last year. So, but he's going to be our starting tackle this year. So we, we need another tackle yeah. eligible tight have, end. <laughs> yeah. Unless if you have that Edmonds guy or yeah. Kevin, Kevin Raider, who I don't know anything about, or uh, Zach Gentry, who is 6'8". Um, yep. <laughs> so maybe uh, you can do something with him. Zach there. Gentry stepped in. He was the uh, the tight end that we drafted last year. Okay, so he needs to step up and play because now Vance McDonald's not there. So uh, and team up with Eric Ebron. Be 
62. How you doing? Right. So, and he was, I mean, so let's, we got some guys to throw the ball to. Uh, let's throw the ball to him and let's have some protection because Pittsburgh needs offensive line. They need some defensive backfield and they need some linebackers. So that's what I would like to see Pittsburgh take. And I don't care if they trade up or trade down to get whoever they need to get, as long as it's the best player at that position. Orland actually, according to this sheet, is not that uh, is actually pretty good size for his height. Because he 208 is at He's got that, oh my gosh, if you blink, he's gone speed. Oh yeah, but like 208 at 5'8 is not a bad um, weight for being for trying to stay healthy when you're that small of a because you have to find some way to stay healthy as that small of a running back. We're putting a comparison of his friend at running back Benny Snell's five ten and two twenty four. So that's only right. It's not even that much more than uh so I think uh he definitely yeah it definitely seems like he's a guy that has a chance at that. Maybe he'll become a Sproles. The who quick, knows? Uh, yeah who knows quick uh catch pass catcher type guy there. Um, but did you have any other guys you wanted to shout out that you could potentially get uh, for the draft um, for your Steelers, or um, did that pretty much uh, wrap it up for you? Yep, that pretty much wraps it up, man. Yeah, for me, the only one other guy I named just because he's Joe Horn's son, um, it might be a good uh, chance to him to actually be good, um, is um, you have... J.C. Horn um, out there as a quarterback, 6'1", 205. I wouldn't mind if the Eagles – he's projected a little bit lower, so I wouldn't be surprised if the Eagles trade down again to get more as such and then draft him if they drafted him more at like 17 or something like that. But uh, he is a guy that I think would fit unique corners. Um, he would also probably fit what the Steelers also potentially could use too from the corner position. So that's a guy that might be able to fit uh, both of our teams – but I think um, when it comes to rounding out um, the podcast for us today for the Sports Fanatic Sportscast, we're getting to the MLB and um, teams that have come out of the gate hot thus far. And then if we think those teams are going to be able to stay there, if we think the divisions will kind of uh, balance themselves out. One of the more interesting things early on when it comes to baseball um, is how are we looking on time, by the way? Yeah, we're good. We're good? Okay. Yeah, we, we um, should be uh, wrapping up here soon, though. Okay. Uh, with baseball, is the Indians obviously moved on from people. They got rid of Frenchie Lindor. They got rid of uh, Carlos Carrasco. They also got rid of, um, what's that guy's name? Mike Clevenger last season to go to the Padres, who's not pitching this season due to injury, but uh, we'll be back. Um, and they're still right now, um, albeit in a division that everybody knows is not one of the best in baseball for who's going to have the best record to win it. But at six and four um, in first place um, in that division and uh, looking pretty good um, thus far, it's going to be interesting if that list from the Indians. I think Chris Rose is an Indians fan who I've always liked as a <laughs> um, kind of summed it perfectly. This team's going to compete in a lot of games because of their pitching rotation, but their offense is going to leave a lot to be desired in most of those games now that you don't have Frenchie and you have Perez and Hedgie, who Perez started hitting for you a bit, but both of those guys are still more of fielding game manager catchers, which is all you need. From the catching position, I think a lot of people overrate catchers and think everybody's JT Real Muto or Yasmani Grandal, which is not the case. But the main job of a catcher is to be the kind of quarterback, your bullpen and rotation. You have to know so much in your head to be able to manage the staff of your bullpen and rotation and know the hitter's tendencies. It's almost just an added bonus when you're also great at hitting. A catcher exactly. just needs to be very good at doing those things. And then uh, if you get the extra, you get the extra. But um, they've been getting uh, the reason why this team's uh, been doing good recently is mainly obviously their pitching's been good. They did bring in a guy that's going to be interesting to look at. He's only hitting 238 in the young season. But if Ahmed Rosario, who they got in the Lindor trade, that's the other reason I wanted to bring up the Indians, is able to get going and be the prospect the Mets thought they would have, be one of those 
not power hitting, but just good hitting uh, fielding shortstops that can utilize his speed pretty well. If he can do that, uh, Jose Ramirez, who normally gets off a little bit slow like he is this year and then just goes absolutely ridiculous later on, if he can do that and Ramirez can do his thing and be in the MVP race as time goes on, they also have Jimenez, who's a top prospect but struggling a bit, so maybe needs a little bit more time. This team just has a lot of guys that are kind of guys that you think might need a little bit more time to develop in Rosario and Jimenez to kind of get where you want them. And then they have Ramirez mixed in. you got Cesar from the Phillies, who's a good role player. So do they have a chance? Yeah, but I still think um, this is a team, if they're going to make it, they're going to make it purely based off of the pitching because all those guys I named, other than one guy and Eddie Rosario, have below a 250 batting average to start the season. Ramirez is going to bring it up because he's an MVP candidate. He always starts off slow. But those other guys, you just need to wait for them to develop. And I think the Indians are about a year away from really winning it, where I think your best favorite, um, usually for most people, is the team that started out 5-5. Five and five. Uh, which is on a three-game losing streak to get them back to 500, is the Twins, I think, is where most yeah. people had the um, the vision going because you just have a team. Your catcher, um, when he's at his best in Garver, does hit a bit down there. You obviously brought in Donaldson, who's out now, which is effective. But when Josh Donaldson's in, uh, he's a good masher. Uh, you got Jorge Polanco. They brought in on Drelton Simmons to really help with the fielding, and he's hitting 355 to start the season, doing great down there. So um, if he keeps doing that, he fits in well. Buxton uh, took a little bit longer than they expected, but now is coming into his own. Kepler um, is a very good player that somebody, I think it was DeRosa compared to McGrady Sizemore, that actually fits. Um, just kind of goes out there, plays, runs through a brick, will run through a brick wall. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's a guy that that makes sense there. So they got the team. Uh, Nelson Cruz is a guy that just gets better with age, even though he's forty something. He still could probably hit forty something home runs to match his age. Uh, so <laughs> um, he's a guy that does really well still. I would still put them, even looking at the way this has been started, as the outset favorite of the division. Where I'm still not changing my second place though, just because they're five and four in the last ten. They have looked good. I like their. Um, Developing guys in the rotation. Danny Duffy has started off really good. The two starts, he has a .75. Um, Brad Keller hasn't started off as hot, obviously, but he'll get going. He's on to a slow start. I still like, um, because of the young guy, Singer, and also just because I think Duffy's going to have a bounce back year and other pitchers they have as youngsters will come up and pitch well. But I like the addition of Minor, too. I still think that Royals team is going to be the team, uh, along with the White Sox that is still right there. But I do think this central division is literally going to be a division if you're not the Tigers, who are in it right now, but they'll fall off eventually. They're the outlier. Right. The top four might be within five games. Like, I don't think anybody's going to run away. This division doesn't have a runaway outlier. So I think you're going to have the top four, honestly, be within. I wouldn't be shocked. Five games of each other, and the Tigers are like 10 to whatever, uh, out by the end of the season as they go back to – balancing out and being the Tigers, just like how Baltimore got off to a five and six pretty decent start. They always go back and balance out. They usually actually get off the decent starts of seasons. Right, 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 right. So um, I think that division's likely to just be within five um, in the top four. But it's exciting how they're starting. The Royals are definitely uh, showing that they are here to compete this year. They brought in some very good players uh, to help them out. Um, Elvis Andrews, um, they, or not Elvis, just Carlos Santana. I mean, they also were able to bring in to help out as well. Not hitting as good yet, but had a, a decent big home run the other day. So if he can get going, that would help. He brought in Andrew Benatendi. Uh, you brought in Michael Taylor, who's a great fielder and thrower. Had outfield assisted very good in their first game of the season. and still doing good in 306. Um, plus Solaire. I think they have a good team to compete. The, um, all these teams, the White Sox... Um, Better than I've expected. I think La Russa's uh, mixed in uh, with young guys and gelled with them a little bit better than I would have first thought. So good for him when it comes to that. This is a division that's tough to pick. I'm just going to keep rolling with the team I had in first to start the season when I did my projections on up. I guess I'll still stay with the Twins, but I still think this division's are within five games for the top four because the Central 
uh, ironically for both leagues, um, is a division that I don't think many teams other than the last place team are going to be the odd out or going to uh, pull away. And the NL Central is the same way. The Reds have started 7-4. and four. They look good, but they have some question marks. The Cardinals probably have the most complete roster, started 6-5, and five, and then you got the Brewers. Because of Yelly bouncing back, I think, and the youngster Keston Hero, who I really like, and the fact that Corbin Burns, uh, they always explain this on MLB Central, which is a show they kind of replicate, like show you guys and how they change themselves, kind of like NHL now. We'll run through it and explain how the guys have got better over time. Okay. Uh, he changed his uh, delivery and changed the way he pitches to be able to now become effective like he is. So it seemed like uh, he has the right mindset. He started as hot as Duffy, a point seven three in the first couple games. Uh, you have um, some good guys out there. You obviously have good bullpen guys, and Williams is one of the better guys. Same with Josh Hader. You have Brandon Woodruff. Uh, they seem to just – Freddie Peralta um, ain't bad either, obviously, um, if he's able to now become a – hone himself into a starter. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> so I still would go with – just because you have the guy that I think is going to bounce back and be in the MVP race again, Kevin Millar picked him as the home run king, so that would help my prediction even better. I'm still going to stick with the Brewers here. I like the Colton Juan addition too. Um, he got injured now with his oblique, but when he comes back, he can play second for you. You can play the outfit. You can play wherever you – Right. Uh, want him to play. Uh, they got another good prospect in Luis Arise on that team. I think this team's just going in the right direction with veterans like Low Kane, Office Ayo Garcia, and Bradley on their team. It just seems like they're pushing in the right direction. So I would say it's going to be them or the Cardinals to win this division um, when it all said and done at the season. But to start the season, um, it's definitely where you want to see these teams. I think you envision the Cubbies kind of falling back a little bit. Um, probably being that team that might end in fourth within the five yeah, to seven. Yeah, yeah. I think the first three teams in this division will also be within three and a half to four games of each other because both central divisions are not the most immense with talent, like, popping off like you go, okay, well, the NL East um, and the AL East have two divisions where – you just look at the firepower of some of the teams where these teams are more, they're just everybody groups themselves together as a full team effort type thing. For a lot of these central teams, they don't have as many outliers minus uh, you have Yelich and you have now Arenado um, on the Cardinals right. um, and, and a couple guys on the Reds. But they the I think these divisions are going to be the closest in baseball, and that's why they'll be exciting to watch. But – um, that's definitely going to be uh, how it goes. Where the NL East is one that will still be close to my Phillies um, division that the Phillies are now tied with the Mets. I'm in first place coming into tonight, uh, four and three to six and five after losing the double header. I still think the Phillies, they started off the season well. I still think the Mets and Braves, like I said before the season, are ahead of us. Um, I would still okay. say the Phillies are more of your third ish team the nationals are doing nationals things again and uh seem to still be caught in a hangover two years later so um if they, if they can get if they can um get going in the right direction they have the team on paper to get going in the right direction the braves are going to get going They're, they have two talent right not. i think you're likely to see the marlins in fourth when all is said and done okay either us or Atlanta, depending who the Mets beat up on more in third, and then the other team in second, because I think the Mets, with the acquisitions they made, will win the um, NL East. So okay. I feel like it's whoever the Mets beat up on the most will be <laughs> third, third place. So it's going to depend on if the Phillies, after losing the two at home, but doing good in their first series against the Mets at CBP, can yeah. answer and uh, do good against the Mets or the Braves, who probably have, like I said, the more complete team to better against the Mets. So I would favor the Braves to be in second, the Phillies to be in third. But I think it is going to depend on who the Mets beat up on more, and that's going to be the factor that makes that <laughs> team the case um, by the end of the season. But I'm happy with what I've seen uh, from our pitching when it comes to the bullpen and all that from the Phillies. The Phillies just need to see the offense get going. Yep. Um, when it comes to that, but I do think that that's one of the most talented overall divisions um, in the sport with those top three teams. Uh, you, you every time you throw on an MLB show, they're talking about the NL East, it seems. So uh, definitely one of the more uh, prominent divisions to talk about. 
when it comes to the West, the Rockies are already an outlier, so they're not even competing early on, let alone them. Okay. This time goes on. <laughs> you know, the Arizona Diamondbacks are a team I thought would be a little bit more in it. They've competed in some games a little bit more, but they're only four and eight. I wouldn't be surprised if they come back to being a little bit more 500. As I don't see them getting in the the Giants again get off to a pretty good uh, start at seven and four, being right behind the Padres. The Dodgers at eight and four, nine and two. Um, if the Giants, with their veterans and the guys they have on their staff, um, and keep doing this, and Buster Posey decided that taking off um, a year for him was the best thing to slice bread, um, then they are a team that could be in third. I don't see that. They're, they're, they're probably the most likely team to be in third place. The The problem with this division is nobody's passing the Padres and nobody's passing the Dodgers. So you're just at this point going, cool, okay. we're pretty good third place. Yeah, team. yeah. <laughs> Where if that what gets you into the wild card, great. The only yeah. problem is guess who you're playing. Whatever team yeah. doesn't win your division. <laughs> so um that might not that, be in a big hurry why, to do that. Yeah, that's why I think the Giants are in a really tough spot. But Kapler has done significantly better, it seems, seemingly. I'm not in San Francisco, obviously, but seemingly has done better with the Giants learning from his mistakes he had in Philly than he obviously did in Philadelphia. Exactly. So um, it seems like in his second job, that's working good, and the Giants are moving in the right direction, but they're not competing with the. Let's be honest. They're not competing with the. Right. Unless Joey Bart comes up and turns into the next coming of Mike Piazza in his second stretch up, they're yeah, not. Right. They're <laughs> not <laughs> Dodgers and. Uh, and the uh, Padres, I mean. And, and Joey Bart could be a great catcher, but he's not going to be Mike Piazza. Most people aren't going to be Mike Piazza. Right. Um, right. Also, local area product, for those that don't know, Norristown right there for Mikey. Um, but the, uh, <laughs> that's the here with our baseball. We'll go into the AL. We already did the AL Central because I wanted to start with the Central Divisions uh, just because of how they're so wacky and – uh, there's just all these middle market teams that don't that are starting to try to spend a little bit more, but still don't know how to fully spend. So you have right. all these, like logged, like just logged up, jammed competitiveness in those divisions. Uh, where uh, with the AL West, um, well, the Athletics actually remembered how to play baseball recently and on a free right. streak after forgetting how to do that for the first uh, week of the season. Um, so they're a team that should be in the race. Uh, the Mariners right now are in it. I feel like the Mariners might be a team that more are fourth place this year showing good signs because you got Giles for your future. You knew he would be out this year. Um, you obviously – Out for the whole year. High France for now and the future. You – um. Have you signed Evan Wright for now in the future? You have Lewis for now in the future. Brian Trammell for now in the future. So this team, I think, was planning is what we'll, we'll try to get better this year, compete more, and then next year and the years further are really when we're going to try to start being in wild guard contention right. and uh, working our way up there. So I see them being more eventually settling in between third and fourth, but I just see the A's uh, being the team, if everybody can actually stay on the field, um, that will be able to – uh, surpass them just from the experience of being able to always find ways to win. The A's are that team that you always just have some random guy eventually. <laughs> for, um, and then uh, they start doing really well. Like it was Montes, and I think that was 18 or 19 before his uh, um, suspension with steroids. And okay. Same sense. But okay. They always have different guys uh, step up for them. So I think that'll happen again, and you'll get them to move up. The Strohs still look good. Okay. They're They'll be up there somewhere. But this is the year. I'm going to stick with it. They're starting pretty good this year. Otani wasn't able to go as deep as I would want, but I have liked the movement and all the things I saw when he was pitching, and he hit a freaking home run when he was pitching too, so that works out. Right. Uh, I think if Cobb can even just pitch to a 4-5, 4-6, be that fifth starter, that's all they need from him. If you can have other guys pitch as you fully hope. Uh, they can actually get to. You need canning to develop them into uh, what you hope he can be. But you are getting what you want. Um, Bundy started the year pretty good again. I think uh, this is a team um, 
that is going to continue to do well and just be able to potentially win this division and finally have what baseball fans have been wanting for a while, Mike Trout. Um, <laughs> How about that? As a division winner and not somebody that can just get eliminated in one game. Uh, yeah, so right. <laughs> I think uh, that's a good chance of that happening this year. When it comes to the East, as we close out our divisions, the Red Sox lost their first three games, then proceeded to go, you know what's great? Winning seven. Um, so weird way to get to seven and three. Um, but okay. <laughs> what, 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 whatever works. Um, you know, works. right? <laughs> uh, Boston's such an odd team. I said this in the past, being a, them as my second team, they're stink. Like I told um, John, they'll, they'll be back. They're like the Flyers. Like they'll make the playoffs, miss, miss, make, miss, make, miss, make. Like the back and forth years you tend to. That will be Boston where last year they were a dumpster fire. Yeah. And then all of a sudden this year everything's going in the right direction. And you're like, oh, wait a minute. But, yeah, but right. it's still too early to say anything. I still think they're more the team. I had it Yankees, Jays, Red Sox. If I had to peg right now. The Jays are still in this weird. We're playing in Florida, then we might play in Buffalo next month. Uh, stretch, okay. um, figuring out where the heck their home even is. Uh, yeah, right. So, but I think they're a team that's still really good. They brought in the right assets. They brought in the people they need. Um, they're a team that's going to compete with Boston all season. It's going to depend if Pearson and other guys for them can stay healthy, along with Ryu, along with the guys like Stripling. Uh, they brought in. If those guys can stay healthy, same with Chatwood, who's injured right. already, um, then they can compete with Boston. If they keep getting banged up, then I would say then it might be Yankees, uh, Red Sox, and then your Rays. But that's going to be another division that I think is good in the top four. I do feel eventually, though, if the Yankees are fully healthy, unfortunately, they might have the best chance of pulling ahead of it at some point. But Boston's the weird team. You never know. They're just a team that somehow bring it all together in some years uh, where they just get, get a run and they just stay hot and then don't stop. When they have players, they yeah. can do that. It's just coming off of last year, you definitely did not expect uh, this good of a start after having a sweep in the first right. thing. But I would still favor the Yankees, I would say, for right now. But um, that would about wrap up our um, baseball um, coverage. Good deal, man. Uh, I'm I'm excited for this season because I think next year is going to be a, a whole different story for baseball because of the CBA not being in place and things like that. So I, I think this year is going to have to be the year where baseball is going to have to try to put its best foot forward. You know what I mean? And try to do its best to try to be there for the fans and try to put a good product out on the field because I, I have a feeling that things are going to fall apart here at the end of the year. Just my Just my gut feeling. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. They have the CBA. It doesn't seem like it'll be too easy when they get there. So, yeah, there is a chance of a lockout. But uh, this season's going good. Um, I, they Maybe they're figuing it out. Um, I hope they do. Season, but, yeah, I hope we're they up do. To that's something we're obviously talk about in uh, future episodes um, as sure. the season ends near and that actually happens in the off season. But I want to thank everybody. That joined us today uh, for joining us. Uh, we appreciate your support. I want to obviously thank Steele um, for co-hosting with me. And um, I want to thank you all for joining. Please like, comment, and subscribe um, to Steel Flyers channel, to my Sports Fan News channel that I'll be posting this on after Steele posts it. And to Peyton on the radio, Off the Wall Hockey, and Pirlo Wisdom, as well as Flyers Nitty Gritty. All great places uh, you can find some good information on us, the game of hockey and all other sports uh, there as well for the steelflyers.com website. Um, did you have any closing uh, thoughts? No, nah, man, I'm, I'm good. We're, we're all good. Uh, I do want to say uh, thank you for our sponsor, uh, www.cccresorts.com. Really appreciate all the support that you've been able to give us here at steelflyers.com and uh, really appreciate all the uh, uh, great information that they've been able to provide for us and a great commercial that you guys get to watch and get to go to. So thank you very much for uh, CCC Resorts for being our sponsor. Thank you very much. Yep, we definitely thank you for the. All right. Well, man, uh, looks like another good one. And uh, we'll catch you guys all on the, the next one. And take care.